because you might ask yourself, why is it that the data centers are in New Jersey, right, to, to start with? Uh, and the best example uh, I can give goes back to the Battle of Waterloo. Okay? Uh, that's the, of course, legendary battle uh, where Napoleon was defeated. Uh, in a very prominent banking family, uh, the uh, uh, Rothschilds uh, sent scouts over to the battle. Uh, and when the scouts figured out that the British were going to have a great victory, they jumped on the fastest schooner across the channel, let the Rothschild know. And what he promptly did, understanding the value of the war bonds was going to go up, he started to sell. And when he sold, then everybody around him said, hey, Rothschild knows what he's doing. We're going to sell too. And of course, secretly, knowing that the value was going to go skyrocketing when General uh, uh, Wellington came back to say, hey, I won the victory, uh, was he was secretly buying them. Uh, and what that lesson showed you, and of course he made got them for pennies on the pounds and made you know, a ton of money. Uh, and what that showed you is the, the value of time. And that gets to why the markets are here in New Jersey. Now in 1998, uh, the SEC in its wisdom uh, permitted uh, algorithmic or electronic uh, trading. Uh, by the year 2000, those trades took about a few seconds consummate from the time they were put in to go through the system. By 2010, it was down to milliseconds. And now in 2020, one one hundredth of a microsecond that these trades get to take place. So, and as of 2020, today, 80% of all the trades no longer take place by humans. I guess humans write the, uh, uh, the software that, that trades them, but they're done through these algorithms. So, like Wall Street, uh, or those who are smart about this will often do, they'll take advantage of, of, of what they can to, to make money. And they should. It's our system. Uh, and uh, to give you a good idea of how this happens, we'll put it out of the Battle of Waterloo and take it to Johnson & Johnson, our own J&J, &J when they had the issue with talcum powder uh, and obviously resulting in, in issues with them that would devalue their stock or cause you maybe to sell it short down the line, uh, they have these news bots. And the news bots, as opposed to you or I, who would, when we see a Bloomberg story come across the, uh, the internet, it might take three or four minutes to register what it means and then decide what we're going to do in our financial positions. These news bots read words like, and in an instant, they're already you know, selling their J&J &J stock or, or selling it short on futures. And so that's really what algorithmic trading has been occurring and, and in effect translated to this high frequency trading. I mean, what, you know, what's that? You know, the high frequency traders take literally infinitesimal price discrepancies that exist for minuscule amount of times. So in the same way, you know, Rothschild back then, time was his benefit as far as making the money he did. Time is the benefit when you're able to interpret the news that quickly. These companies and the high frequency traders are able to get in, and so long as they're first in line, they make a cent or two, maybe as much as a buck, but usually a lot less than that. I think on the average, about 0.3% of a penny, uh, but that adds up after a while relative to that high, high volume. And this is why it is important for all of these exchanges to be within a very close proximity to the market. But what happened around 2012? Well, the, 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 the big boys figured it out. And Citibank uh, or Goldman Sachs or whoever said, hey, wait a minute, exchanges. We want our servers to be in the exact same building as your servers. Well, that sounds great, the New Jersey Stock or New uh, York Stock Exchange, because they get, to get paid a couple bucks in rent to have their servers down in the basement. And they're all about a fair market. So what they say, everybody can keep their servers here. And I'm going to give you all the exact same length of micro fiber. Uh, and you'll all be in within like one millionth of a millisecond of each other. So this is why high frequency trading on some level, the volume was going crazy. It's leveled off on some level. And why all of these various exchanges, and there's a bunch. I'm using the New York Stock Exchange because it's the biggest in the world. Uh, but they have become their own ecosystems. And they tell you they could leave and go elsewhere. The exchanges could. Those data centers can, can go just about anywhere, in the country or 
or in the world for that matter. Uh, the distance no longer matters because of the way bought the servers next to each other. So now, I, you know, I can get crazy with, with high frequency trading and, and why, you know, it's not, in my opinion, very good uh, for our economic system as opposed to rewarding, you know, companies with capital that have strong management or, you know, uh, strong patents or whatever reasons are. Uh, what this is about is maybe basically robot wars, you know, making a, a tiny bit of money in order to make a profit down at the end of the day. Uh, and, you know, the, the recursions, flash crashes, market volatility and reduced liquidity is what high frequency trading, you know, has brought to the market, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, you know, they, they then these, these uh, algorithms started to put out false information uh, and they made a lot of money again. Uh, and then, then the SEC said, wait a minute, this is, this is stock manipulation. It's always the technology and, and the traders like this seem to be a step ahead of the law. The law ever catch them? Absolutely not. You know, until something else the next time. But the latest thing, FTRs are in, they're in these, uh, in these dead pools. And for all you smart kids that uh, trade your shares of stock on Robinhood, well, well, guess what? In the way that the high frequency trading is now on an even playing field with Goldman Sachs and alike, in the dead pools, they're not because they go ahead and the, the, those Robin Hoods don't charge somebody on their own exchange to make an exchange. What they do is they allow the high frequency traders to pay them a boatload of money so they could do the same things in the dead pool. So keep that in mind if you're on Robin Hood as to why it is they're not charging you anything because they're giving fees the, the advantage. In any event, my, my soliloquy is uh, is over to the extent of, of you know why the, the exchanges are within the proximity of as they are in New Jersey. They really don't have to be anymore based on how things have changed. Uh, but what does this bill do? I've listened to everyone and I understand that at, even at a micro cent, at a 0.25 cents, that that's enough, especially with the way that uh, these small amounts of money are being made, that it would really uh, affect the market. I also understand that they could leave. So the current set of amendments has hopefully incentivized them not to do that. First off, by sending it to just one one hundredth of the cent, it's, although it will mean a lot to the taxpayer of New Jersey, it won't mean a lot to investors or anybody else that's an aspect of the market. As well as the two-year sunset provision, uh, that will hopefully include the motivation of that are we really going to move our data centers, you know, or dismantle New Jersey centers as a secondary site uh, for the sake of two years? Now, the, the fiscal note is out, uh, and the the amount of money that that one one hundredth of a penny <clears throat> means to the taxpayers of New Jersey is about five hundred million dollars a year. We're basically talking about a billion dollars here. Who's paying that? Now, it's up the exchanges are going to collect it for us, uh, but if they pass that along to the to the banks or to that aspect of it, they can. Can the banks pass that along to their customers? They can. That's going to be up to them. I won't go on a sidebar about how much money the five major banks are making through the second quarter of this year where everybody else is hurting, but it's billions and in the billions and more than they made the year before. But that's up to them if they want to pass that along. If you're here in New Jersey like we are, that being passed along to New Jersey investors? Well, yeah, but it's being passed along to investors, not only all over the country, but all over the world. So New Jersey citizens are paying a tiny sliver of that. It almost reminds me of uh, a federal match. It, it's almost that good for our, for our taxpayers relative to the very minuscule amount, of that billion dollars over two years, and I'll actually come out of New Jersey pockets. Uh, I can go through a lot of, tangential, you know, benefits of this. I, I tell you that, you know, sadly, uh, the, the top 10% uh, of the earners in this country have 94% of the dollars that are lined up that are, are as a part of all these respective uh, markets and these products that would be encompassed by this bill. Uh, so this is progressive to say the least, uh, in that you're talking uh, about a, a buck 30 a year. On an, on an individual. And now if you're an individual investor who likes to buy shares on their own, first 10,000 exchanges, not shares, but transactions, 
uh, are uh, exempted. Uh, and so, so with all of that, uh, I, I really, along with the prime sponsor, Senate President Sweeney, listened. Uh, and we think that this is a, a very reasoned compromise. And then just the last point to make is like, well, this great financial industry here in New Jersey and Hoboken and, and in Jersey City, are they all going to go away? No, they're not. They don't have to. In the same way that the New York Stock Exchange said, hey, we're going to prove to you that we could move. And you didn't have to prove it to me. I knew you could. And they traded out of Illinois for, for three days. You didn't see everybody have to move to go chase them. It doesn't have to happen anymore. It won't. So that's something else that they have out there that uh, the uh, fallout to this. That what I'm asking this industry to be a part of the solution. And what's the most difficult time? Uh, I will bore you to tears if I went through uh, the reasons why we could do per the Constitution and per the Supremacy Clause, the Commerce Clause, and the Internet Act, Freedom Act, uh, while attorneys are a lot smarter than me uh, that uh, deal with this kind of issues day in, day out, have said this is absolutely legal. If this is what we determine to do under the case law that's already there and otherwise. I, I hope that the panelists don't have getting into that kind of esoteric part of this, because it's almost the tail wagging the dog. Uh, but again, a lot of this has listened to what they've had to say already. Uh, I, I think if they don't concede that there's significant, extraordinary compromise on our part as to where the bill has traveled to, uh, then they would be disingenuous. And, and the last piece of what I say is that uh, there's no aspect of animus that I have, uh, or any of it should, uh, toward Wall Street or the financial industries. They are our neighbors, our friends. We should celebrate uh, the profits that, that are made, notwithstanding my misgivings uh, about high frequency trading and how I think that's negative for the market, but we're not Congress, Congress to figure out. And the last point, because I'm the chairman and I could make it, is you could run, but you can't hide, right? Because Illinois, uh, funny enough, where the New York Stock Exchange ha ha is, has a, a, uh, a piece of legislation pending in that state already, basically to do the same thing, as we are only at an extent that's not sunsetted and for money that's much more significant. And so wherever one might go, let alone the federal government and their consideration of this as an appropriate and fair source of resources, is probably with the future. Uh, so uh, 